Welcome to Residential Tech Talks. I'm Jeremy Glowacki, Executive Editor of Residential Tech Today. On this week's podcast, Avi Rosenthal joins us from Ashburn, Virginia, where he is managing partner of Blue South Partners, a company launched three and a half years ago to help startups as well as established companies manage the Internet of Things business landscape. Through their deep connections with manufacturers, dealers, retailers, and users, Blue Sav and its team of consultants help clients with the insights and resources needed to develop, market, and manufacture products and services for the IoT industry. Avi has held leadership roles throughout the IoT industry, including Nortec, Lagrand, Evolve, and Superna. He also recently returned from the Integrated Systems Europe Convention in Barcelona, Spain, which will be right at the top of my list to discuss today. That and our shared love of the New York Yankees. And I, I'm hoping yeah. that Avi did not ice the Yankees because when he saw them in Baltimore recently, <laughs> they did lose and they've lost two in a row for the first time, I believe, in the short season. So hoping for uh, better things to, ahead. And Avi, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast to talk Yankees and the Internet of Things. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, it's a, it was a really rough Sunday in Yankee uh, Yankeeville, uh, New York, uh, this past weekend. But they did win on Saturday, so I'm hoping that whatever coolness I gave them on Thursday when I saw them, they then won on Saturday, and and we won't talk about what happened yesterday. <laughs> uh, but it's a pleasure to be here. I'm I'm very excited. Uh, we've known each other a long time, but. I've never been on your podcast before, and I'm I'm so looking forward to it. So thank you so much. Yeah, and, and in fact, we've been on podcasts together. We were, uh, I believe, a, at least a couple of times on Resi Week AV Nation's podcast. And uh, yes. as I said before, we started recording. I, I always appreciate being on with you because you you do uh, have a lot of great insights, and you 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 don't mind talking a bit, and I don't always love talking so much. So. No, there's a, no, it's, it's harder to get me to shut up than it is to get me to talk. So it's, it's not a problem at all. <laughs> well, one of the places I see you when we're at trade shows together is the, um, the Z-Wave Alliance mm -hmm. booth. And I, I saw in my research that I guess I didn't realize that you were a Z-Wave uh, board member. So, yes. um, has that were they, was that just a great place for you to hang out and find potential clients because there are a lot of younger companies, smaller companies that need mm -hmm. that kind of advice. And then you became a board member or was it sort of the other way around that you'd already kind of gotten involved there? And I just hap happened to realize you're <laughs> on the board now. <laughs> so uh, I've been involved with the Z-Wave uh, technology almost since its inception, right? It, it uh, dates back to the late 1990s. Um, I was introduced to it while I was at Legrand way back in the day. Um, and I've been a, a, a fan of the technology for many, many years. Uh, a lot of the companies that you listed that I've worked for, my role there was in product development and and what I did was actually design and develop a lot of Z-Wave product over the years. So I was actually on the board um, when it first started. And then uh, when I became a consultant, I, I fell off the board. You know, being a board member in these alliances typically uh, requires a, a strong financial investment, not just a, a time investment. Um, thankfully, the Z-Wave folks asked me to come back onto the board as an advisor, which I, I did. I started again with them last November. And I do hang out in the Z-Wave pavilion a lot at the shows. It always tends to be a really great hub of activity, right? There's, there's always new companies there and established companies. There's new technology being introduced, new ways of looking at connected products in general. Um, so although they all tie together with the Z-Wave language, the Z-Wave protocol, it's a great place to to meet and greet sort of people new to the industry, uh, as well as people that are established. It, for me, it's always like, you know, the high school reunion. You know, we hang out at the ZOA Pavilion, especially during CES, and it's my annual high school reunion. My mm -hmm. favorite week of the year, people hear me say that all the time, um, and they are, they are just, you know, blown away by the fact that I've got all of this stuff going on. Um, but CES is absolutely my favorite week of the year, and it's when I get to see all of my friends and all of my uh, uh, work friends, right? All of my coworkers, um, and it's a great place to to learn about the newest stuff. I picked up a whole bunch of clients, um, whether they are in the construction side of the business. We're now doing uh, consulting to builders, home builders who want to understand uh, new technologies and what to include in their homes. That's part of our practice now, as well as um, companies that have great ideas, right? Blue Sab, we're a group that was formed to help people take back of the napkin ideas 
and turn them into products. Hmm. And we can help them from ideation and product development and manufacturing all the way through to things like product placement, whether it be in retail or in uh, online purchases or in the pro channel, which is really where our specialty is, right? The, the Cedia group. So it's been a lot of fun. And Z-Wave's just sort of always been that thread, right? Right. And and I say that on purpose because we'll talk about thread later. <laughs> yes, thread. <laughs> that That's the technology that kind of gets me can, a little confused at this point. So maybe you can uh, help shed some light there. But we'll get there in a little bit. Before we get there, though, uh, you recently returned from the International Systems Europe ISC show in Barcelona. First time it was the first time in Barcelona. I can't remember now with COVID. Yes. yes. So yes. Uh, that uh, that I've seen a lot of social posts about it and experiences, pictures from people uh, that I know, but I haven't spoken to anyone about the show. What was your um, your feeling about that event uh, in general, new location? And we can talk about what things you saw that were kind of cool there. Yeah. Um, so I've been going to ISC uh, pretty much 24 five years now, 22 years, something along those lines, right? Right around the turn of the century, <laughs> uh, I started going. I love saying that to people because they're always like, oh, the turn of the century, wait, <laughs> the century turn? Um, anyway, so yeah, The first of all, the best thing about the show this year is that it was not in Amsterdam and I did not get snowed on. <laughs> yes. um, typically, this show is the first week of February. I can't tell you how many Super Bowls I've watched, mm. you know, in the wee dark hours of the morning because uh, we're all huddled around a computer someplace watching the Super Bowl. But Barcelona is a fantastic city. I've been there a, a few times and it was really great to have the show in Barcelona. This was the rescheduled version. It will go back to the first week in February next year. They've already announced that, but they had pushed it out just to make sure that we were all over the COVIDs. Um, the show was phenomenal. The show was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I think the numbers are out now. They were, they were well over 45,000 people that showed up for the show, which is certainly pre-COVID numbers. Um, I attended the last ISC in Amsterdam. That was actually in the February before COVID, or or I guess during the very beginnings of COVID, you know, where it was that January, like everybody was washing their hands, but nobody was wearing a mask yet because we didn't know any better. <laughs> right. um, and that show was, was fairly well attended as well. Um, and Amsterdam was always a great city. I mean, I have nothing against Amsterdam at all other than the snow. Right. Um, but the Barcelona show this year, I think that the, uh, the the reaction that everybody has is to travel again. And so the show was extremely well attended. Um, virtually every major vendor that I could think of was actually there. Um, we got to see, excuse me, Crestron and Savant and the boys. Um, interestingly enough, you know, Snap only had a small presence. Elon only had a small presence. Um, I think also because some of the companies got caught unawares that the show would actually be as good as it was. Mm -hmm. uh, my own Z-Wave Alliance, for instance, we had canceled our booth for the show back in March, thinking that it was going to be not so great. Yeah. Um, we were completely wrong. And I'll be the first one to admit it. Um, it was There were a bunch of new companies, a bunch of really well-established companies, um, you know, Sony had a big presence. A lot of the big names that you, you know and love in our industry were all there. Um, I think probably one of the coolest things I saw was the new Crestron home program that they're rolling out, which is sort of removing some of the walled garden things that they've had over the past few years mm -hmm. um, and really opening up Crestron to to more mainstream dealers. I, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a, a retail brand yet. Right. I mean, it's no. not a DIY brand. Right. Um but certainly the dealers are going to gain more access to the brand and more access to the technology. Uh, RTI. RTI had a huge booth presence, and I was very impressed with what Joe Roberts has put together uh, as part of his offering. And, and you know, Joe is the, the new CEO. He's been there now a little while mm -hmm. uh, and really brought that company up. I was very impressed with their software connectivity. Some of the new, they have a new waterproof remote control, for instance, which is going to be great for outdoor use. Um, but some really nice products, some really nice um, uh, technology and the way that it all integrates together. Um, there was a, a new company out of uh, England called Lithe Audio, L-I-T-H-E Audio. They do an in-wall speaker system that has a built-in amp so you can stream directly to the speaker. You run a simple piece of PoE to it. Um, really cool setup. They're not here in the States yet in any kind of real big push, but they're coming. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was very impressed with what they had in their technology. But overall, Barcelona put on a great, great show. Um, I will say that the uh, 
<laughs> the food was a lot of fun. They had a big area set up with food trucks with with all kinds of Spanish and, and European food um, mm-hmm. that was very well attended. Great networking spaces. Uh, if you've ever been to the Fira in Barcelona, it's also where Mobile World Congress is held each year. So they really know how to handle the crowds. They really know how to handle. Uh, there, there's a metro station right at the Fira, so it was easy to get in and get out. Um, and even though there were 45,000 people who were essentially all newbies, right? I mean, none of us had been to an ISE in this location before. Um, the traffic was handled very well. You know, we did our little COVID thing. Uh, everybody who went to Spain had to have a green QR code. Mm-hmm. And once you had that green, green QR code, you were good to go for the show as well. Okay. Uh, and so they made it very easy, but they were, you know, taking the right precautions, um, you know, the masking and things are still going on in Europe and they, everybody was following the rules, but the show itself, very, very well done. And Barcelona rolled out the red carpet. They actually had banners up and down the main avenues of the city, welcoming all of us to the city. It was wow. really, really nice. I, that reminds me of my, one of my first conventions I attended prior to being in the, uh, technology space, uh, it was a less glamorous industry, a very important industry, but it was, uh, the pulp and paper making industry oh. right out of college. I was in a trade magazine and going my first trip to New Orleans. And I was excited about that. You know, I'm 23 years old and I want to see what this fun party city, city is like. And they had banners up for this stinking paper convention. And I thought that was just so lame. I'm like, I don't want to be reminded of my work while I'm here. You know, it's why I'm there, but whatever. Why I'm that right? right? Yeah. Yeah. But you're like, Barcelona, how glamorous. And then well, yeah, we're here for work. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm sitting in a in a in a uh, sidewalk cafe, sipping my uh, my my chocolate and my churro, and you look up and there's a banner, you know, up above you saying "Welcome, ISC." You know, yeah, yeah. in about 18 different languages. It was just, it was nice. That's was cool, nice. though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so that, you kind of answered some of the questions I had about how you look at a trade show. You you do get a lay of the land, like I would as a as an editor. Oh, yeah of just what are these big companies doing? They're not clients, but they're linking to stuff that perhaps my clients would want to know about. So get, get as much information and intel as you can. You're not necessarily there uh, to meet with clients or to, to find new clients. Uh, it's just, it's an information gathering place for you as much as anything I would imagine. Yeah, it's really all three. I mean, the mm. as if you can tell, I love a trade show. I have <laughs> loved trade shows since I was a little kid. My dad comes from the technology industry as well. Okay. Used to bring me to Comdex when I was, you know, 10, 12 years old. So I've been going to trade shows essentially my my entire life. And I love a good trade show. <laughs> so for me, it's a little bit of a treasure hunt, right? You have yeah. to see everything so that you understand what's going on in the industry. It's an opportunity to meet and greet. It's an opportunity to find new clients. I certainly use it for that. And in this particular case, I have a client that I'm working with that is developing um, some new technologies and some some new effort. And it was a little bit of a research opportunity for us, right? To get an understanding of the lay of the land, understand what was out there and what his competition might look like, uh, where he could cooperate and which companies he could cooperate with. Mm. So I, I do look at it from sort of all views, but uh, I have a partner, David, who, who says all the time, you can never... Uh, overestimate the chance conversation you're going to have on a trade show floor, mm-hmm. right? Um, those are invaluable. And and during COVID, I can tell you for myself personally, I really missed that interaction. I bet. There's just so much you can do sitting in your own spot, you know, surfing the web or talking to people on the phone. Those incidental conversations you have in the halls of trade shows, I, I have closed more business, you know, whether it be my consulting life or my previous life, my manufacturing life, or before that, my integrator life, I've, I've made more connections and, and closed more business in those incidental conversations than I ever have in a, in a scheduled appointment. And so it's so great to be back. It's so great to be, you know, I, I have gone to every trade event you can think of this year so far. Um, I've been to the Builder Show and CES and a whole bunch of others. I'm looking forward to Infocom. In a uh, couple of weeks, I'll be out in Vegas. So, you know, trade show events are such an opportunity for all of us to gather, but it's also that exchange of idea, yeah. right? It's it's learning, it's understanding, it's it's looking for the right opportunities. So incredible. Yeah, you mentioned Infocom, and I see the amazing thing about that event, and the overwhelming part of it is how it's a blend of the residential and the commercial. 
uh, integration spaces. So how much of that uh, commercial side do you dive into or is it just more of awareness of that side? It, it's much more awareness. We do very little commercial work. We've done um, some work with sensors with occupancy, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and so occupancy obviously being a very big deal. Uh, in the energy management side and in the security side, which is really where my background, the sweet spot of my background is in the, you know, residential integration of security and AV. Um, but we, so we do a little bit of that, but for the most part, you know, I would say, you know, 90% of my time is spent on residential. Um, but it's good to know the commercial side because a lot of technology these days transfers back and forth. Right. A lot of the occupancy detection stuff that started in commercial is now flowing to residential. Uh, a lot of the control aspects of residential are now flowing to commercial. Um, I did a stint when, when I was with Evolve. I did a stint in hospitality. And that's really where you see a really good blending. Really, yeah. really. Uh, where you see a good blending of the residential and the commercial. It has to be robust enough and have broad enough connectivity to work as a commercial product. But at the end of the day, a, a hotel room is just a small house. Right. And so you use a lot of the same residential technologies. And so there's always sort of been this crossover. The ISE show is also a really good, it's it's sort of like an Infocom in that, from that perspective, you know, it's the joint between Avixia and Cedia. So there is a, a, a reasonable amount of commercial stuff going on at that show as well. Infocom, same kind of thing. Um, there were many years where as a residential integrator, I didn't attend Infocom because it had swung so far over to the commercial side it's sort of in the middle now and and, and you know i think it's uh it's swung back and you're getting this blending i mean just crestron as a company they've always been a fixture in the residential space right but yeah. you know with control four and savant and some of the others the, their position within the residential space eroded a little bit mm -hmm. and to their credit they're now coming back really strong in that space the crestron home program and some others yeah. um and so it's interesting to see how they're pushing the pendulum back the other way into the resi space by leveraging what they've learned over the years in the commercial space. Mm, that's an interesting way to, to, to observe that. I hadn't really figured that out. I know that I, I get spun a story as a, as an editor, as a journalist, where sure. sometimes you just don't know what the real story is if you don't know the history. And, and what I always heard from Crestron is our, our core business has always been commercial. It's like a ton of, it's high percentage of our business. So that's why we don't need to go to CD anymore. And I don't know how much was, was true or what, what it was there on the competition side, but uh, the, the embrace of the residential side and pulling from that commercial experience makes sense. Um, however it happened, but um, it, it, I went to see their road show um, Whenever that was, I, I'm losing track of what months things happen now. If it, that was in the fall or it was the beginning of the year up in Chicago. And it was really great to see all of it come together after I'd been yeah. having Zoom calls about it and sort of piecing it together. But it looks like it's really, really well conceived. And, and uh, you know, Mr. Clancy there, I think, has just been a great oh, yeah. key to that whole residential business. He really just takes it on and is passionate about it. And, and it yeah, and I and I think that's uh, that, you know, I think COVID changed a lot of things in the world. That's that's an understatement, right? But I think it also showed the power of what's going on within the residential side of the business. Yeah, some people had to be convinced; others knew it all along. But there's not an integrator you can talk to that didn't have a positive impact in his business from the fact that we all just spent two years, you know, hidden out in our homes. Yeah. Um, and so from that perspective, I think everybody recognizes now the the power of it. You look at what's going on, even in the big tech companies, you know, the, the, the Apples and the Amazons and the Googles of the world, you know, even they're more focused on the residential side and what they can bring to the residential side, not just from a controls perspective, but from a level of services, data collection, you know, how they can monetize these things. To me, the next five years are going to be much more interesting than the last five years. And I don't say that lightly. I, I say it because I truly believe that the inflection point we've been looking for in home control is going to go from home control, from, from passive home control to active home automation. And, you know, we've been using the term home automation for uh, my entire career, I don't know, 25 plus years. Um, and we've never truly seen a, a proactive experience within the home. We've talked about it. We've discussed it. There are some bespoke versions of it out there. 
but sort of this idea that we're going to have the home anticipate our need and anticipate our desires before we know it that's really you know that's that's jetsons right that's the true holy grail we're we're almost there right we're almost you can see the beginnings of it you can start to understand things like the analytics and and the the visual analytics the data analytics you look at camera technology and how it's evolving i truly believe that we're going to there's going to be a breakthrough in occupancy detection very soon and once you start to put these data collection sets in place, then some real magic starts to happen. Then it becomes all about the software and not just about the hardware. And up until now, it's really been all about the hardware. How small, how efficient, you know, those kinds of things. We're going to get to the software. It's going to get exciting. Well, I want to continue that, that conversation here just a, a bit. But first, we need to take a short break uh, with our conversation with Avi Rosenthal. Do you want superior smart home automation at a great value? Shelly Wi-Fi relays by Alterco Robotics cover DC to line voltage, allowing you to control lights, outlets, appliances, garage doors, pumps, and much more. There are Shelly sensors and power measurement devices to help you measure temperature, humidity, lux, or motion, and electrical consumption from single wire to three phase with neutral. You can use Shelly with a licensed driver for Control 4, Elon, or other premium systems, as well as your customer's existing hub, voice assistant, or any platform that accepts REST, MQTT, or CoAP. Shelly can make IoT very easy. Available now at Blackwire, City Electric Supply, and Worthington, or at ShellyUSA.com. Welcome back. We're talking with Avi Rosenthal from Blue Sav Partners. Uh, Avi, as you talk about this... Um, this idea of the the automated home, uh, the the responsive home. Um, how do you see the I guess the d- development changing for the mass consumer versus like the integrated higher end home? Uh, where's can you p- sort of see some of the potential where that's going to come from? And are we talking AI basically here or? You know, AI is one of those ubiquitous um, concepts, right? That everybody likes to talk about machine learning, AI, things of that nature. Yeah. And and I don't belittle AI at all. I I certainly don't discount it at all. I think it's important. I think that, you know, machine learning and, and a system learning your habits and looking for changes. I was involved very early in my consulting career. I was involved with a group called One Event. And One Event, you know, did just that. They had a predictive analysis model where it would look for patterns and then it would predict what was going to happen next over time based on those models. Mm -hmm. Um, It can be, it it can be very difficult because of outlier, but it can also be very easy because as human beings, we're fairly consistent, right? We, We do things fairly consistently. And so you can start to predict that. And I think as that artificial learning comes about, whether it's artificial intelligence or machine learning or whatever, whatever, you know, brand we give it. I think the concept is starting to learn the patterns, understand the patterns. You know, I have Amazon devices in my home Mm -hmm. and they are intelligent enough to start asking me questions like it's six o'clock in the evening. We notice your front door isn't locked and it's been locked every other day for the last 30 days. Would you like me to lock it? Mm. That's, that's a very small step, but a very important step in recognizing the pattern of my front door has been locked every day for 30 days at six o'clock, right? The more we apply the data sets to this and the more we apply what we can collect, the better predictions we can make. And so I don't see it necessarily as a singular event. I think there are a number of things that are working within the industry that are going to help this data collection that Google and Amazon are working on, for instance, is a big step. We've now been living with natural language processing boxes in our homes for the better part of five years. Mm -hmm. They've gotten much better. They've also collected a ton of data about us. And I know some people might be a little scared at that and I, and I get it. I I understand it. It's a, anytime you go through a technology revolution, it's scary. No, no worries. Um, But I think that they've, so far threaded the needle in and and walk the fine line between creepiness and privacy 
there have been missteps, nothing's perfect, but I think that people are becoming more accustomed to the idea that there's something listening in their home. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we put that aside. We've now collected all this data. The other thing that I personally have been working on is a lot of sensors in the last five years. Okay. Temperature, indoor air quality, um, light, motion, uh, water, right? Gas, all kinds of different sensors. Millions of them are sold each year. Each sensor has the ability to collect another point of data. I tell my clients all the time, you're not in the water sensor business, you're in the data collection business, all right? You may make a water sensor, you may make a motion sensor, you may make a door window sensor, but you're not in the sensor business, you're in the data collection business. Your job is to efficiently collect your piece of data and report it up to the cloud or what have you in order for that data to be collected efficiently, reliably, right, and, and consistently. Battery life, things of that nature are all important. So now we have two things. Now we have the learnings of the natural language processing boxes, and we have all of this data being collected. Mm -hmm. Then you bring in cameras. What's the number one accessory that's being sold in the last, I don't know, five, six years? Doorbell cameras, right? right? There's, there's virtually not a house out there that, you know, at least in my neighborhood, you drive up and down the streets and everybody's got one form or another of a doorbell camera, all right? Um, and they've been very, very popular. Why? Well, people like to see who's at the front door, but it's also the analytics have gotten better. We know the difference between a car driving by and a person walking up. We know the difference between, you know, a raccoon running by and, and uh, you know, a car parking in the driveway. Th those kinds of analytics are now a third set of data. So now you have three different sets of data that you can start to derive information from. When did I pull up into my driveway? Who's at my front door? Which person walked in my home? What temperature do they like? What temperature do they set things to? How often is there a water leak? When is the door opened and closed? What do I ask my NLP box to do on a regular basis? You feed all of this data together and you can start to make intelligent decisions on what happens next. Right. And that's really where it gets interesting. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, within the next five years, that's where we're headed. Okay. And I think it's going to start at the high end. You know, I think our friends at Control 4 and Savant, because they have built-in systems and they have access to all this data and they have uh, a little bit more sophisticated technology, may start with it at their level, but it'll very easily trickle down. You look at what's going on with something like matter. Mm -hmm. Matter is not going to solve this problem. What matter is going to do is it's going to homogenize the ability for people to control various devices within their home from a single point of control. Mm -hmm. That's important because not only are we collecting the data, then we have to make a good decision. Then we have to be able to affect the environment based on the data we've collected, based on that decision. The easiest way to do that is to have a unifying language that everybody speaks. Right. That's where matter comes in. Okay. Yeah. And so some of the responses I would imagine, uh, temperature in the home, that's a comfort thing. Uh, the, the light in the home, that's another one, whether you're opening and that could affect temperature as well, if it's a blinds or shades, um, and the light level time of day. And we talk about the health benefits of those things. Absolutely. Um, you know, color temperature of the light, um, obviously security, just that peace of mind, knowing that things are locking at the right time, not leaving something unlocked when you go to bed, um, knowing people, uh, are coming and going. So those are some of the things I can imagine would be, uh, good progress where you're taking out a lot of the, the habits of ha the hassles of going around and right. op opening, closing things or locking things or turning lights at certain levels and just having it really understand your lifestyle and your, it, it, it the intuition about what it is that you want it to do. Um, so am I missing anything as far as those? So you're, routines? you're, you got to think of the next level up. Okay. So you're, you're talking about what the homeowner is capable of doing, right? Mm -hmm. we're going to, we're going to ease the burden on the homeowner to remember things, mm -hmm. but in doing so, we're going to, we can ease that burden further. When was the last time you checked the batteries in your smoke detector? When was the last time you checked the filter in your air conditioning system? 
When was the last time you had to get up on a ladder and change a light bulb? When was the last time you cleaned out your gutters? When was the last time you checked the sump pump in your basement to make sure it's draining properly? Right. All of the general maintenance things that go on in your home can be solved if we add a sensor and we layer services on top of it. Mm -hmm. So I know that there are companies out there that are working on platforms, software platforms that are going to eliminate all of these general maintenance things and turn them into software as a service. Okay. So it's less about having to remember to do the mundane <laughs> and more about just paying somebody a monthly fee to take care of it all. Mm. When was the last time you checked the cybersecurity settings in your computer? Right. right. When was the last time you backed up your phone? When was the last time you backed up your pictures? There's a whole host of things that we right now as technology consumers have to remember and as homeowners we have to remember that in the future will be taken care of by somebody else. Okay. Now that could be a person, that could be an automated system, that could even be a bot, right? Where something just shows up at our front door. There's a whole host of things that right now we do that in the future, somebody else is going to take care of for us. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of people out there that are willing, you know, if I said to you, okay, it's a hundred bucks a month. Your first reaction is, wow, hundred bucks a month. It seems like a lot of money. Okay. But these are all the things I'm going to do for you, mm -hmm. right? You're never going to have a burned out light bulb. You never have to worry about the battery in your front door lock. You're never going to have to worry about the air that in your house is not clean enough because you forgot to change the filter. You're not going to worry about the safety and security of your home because the batteries and your smoke detectors are going to get taken care of. You're not going to have dirty windows because we're going to come by. We're going to clean the outside of the house, right? We're not going to worry about your landscaping because I got a robot that's going to show up and cut your grass, <laughs> right? So there's a whole bunch of things that the average homeowner doesn't like to do. And that's not to detract from the ones that do. I know plenty of people who love, you know, the, the honeydew list in, on the weekends, <laughs> no problem at all. But there's a whole host of people that don't. And if we can layer these services on and we can layer them in such a way where we're proactive, then we don't have to charge a lot of money. The number one expense that the average integrator deals with is a truck roll. Yeah. Right. Something breaks. He's got to put a guy in a truck or a girl, I shouldn't say guy anymore, a person mm -hmm. in a truck, right? That truck has then got to travel to the homeowner, got to diagnose the problem, may not have the part that they need in order to fix it. And so now it's two truck rolls, all right? So what if we eliminate all of that? What if we proactively know that the health of the network is not good enough and we send the integrator an alert, something changed, something's wrong. You know, maybe one of the kids came home and hooked up a new computer system or a new gaming system and it's soaking up all the bandwidth and the cameras can't connect anymore. Or the refrigerator is all of a sudden drawing 20% more power than it was a week ago. Right. Send a repair guy out. Maybe it's as simple as cleaning the coil or maybe, in fact, we get to offer them a new refrigerator. Mm -hmm. Right. This just without sensors and data collection, we can't perform any of those tasks. Right. That makes sense. It, you blew my mind for a second while we were talking, while you were talking about the uh, doorbell cameras, because it just occurred to me that they have have gotten smarter because I have one of them, of course, like everybody. Mm -hmm. And it used to just tell me, oh, well, we, we just got our garbage picked up. The trash truck went by right. and it doesn't do that anymore. And that's fine. I don't need to know that. Um, and, you know, it's usually a distraction when I'm on a trip or something to, to have that mm -hmm. come up. And it, it's just now only people. I mean, it really is yeah. just when someone either is at the door or rings the doorbell. And uh, that that's uh, that's technology learning. <laughs> um, exactly. So so that's pretty cool. Um, well, I, I, not not that this isn't a great conversation, but I always like to like learn more about where folks come from in their career. Sure. And you've touched on several things. Uh, one of them was that when you're a kid, you're around uh, technology with your dad. Um, that was your earliest interest, it sounds like, in technology. No, so so I, I come by this in my DNA. So I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you the, the, quick, the quick part of the story. So my dad was actually one of the original engineers for Sid Harmon at right. Harmon Carden. Okay. Um, he was part of the development team of the very first tubeless amplifier that Harmon came out with in the 60s. It was called the Citation One. Okay. So my dad was a, he, he put himself through college building televisions 
and repairing televisions for people. And so when he graduated college, um, he was recruited by, by uh, Sid to go and work on Long Island for Sid Harmon, was part of this development team. I actually have his original engineering notes and engineering manuals from that development. It's, it's some cool stuff. And so my dad being a, a you know, a, a, a geek and a nerd, right, in the 60s, um, was into technology, you know, his entire life. And so as soon as I was old enough, I mean, I can remember we uh, we had an Apple computer in like 1977. You know, we had one of the very first Apple computers wow. he had read about, you know, what Steve Jobs and, and Wozniak were doing out in California. And he actually sent away for one of the computers. And we had one of the, you know, one of the first Apple IIs that was available. Um, and he got involved with the computer industry very early on. Uh, he used to work the big iron, the, the mainframes and things, and then the personal computers. And so at a very young age, as soon as they started with these local conferences that then turned into these major conferences, you know, I was brought along. And and I, you know, at, from a very, very young age, all I ever wanted to do was work in technology. Okay. Um, I didn't necessarily know exactly what I wanted to do in technology, but I, I knew that I was going to work in technology. Um, and I can remember he used to sneak me into the the trade shows because nobody would let a 13-year-old kid into a trade show floor, right? I mean, they used to put me in a little suit and tie and, you know, dress me up and make me look <laughs> older than I was. But, you know, I, I, I remember there was there was one in New York City where, you know, we went in and the guard is like, hey, that kid's not allowed in here. And, you know, my dad had a screaming match with the guy oh, no. to get me in. And then, you know, of course, they they eventually acquiesced and, and they let me in. And this was before you had, you know, child prodigies in the computer industry, which are very prevalent now. You know, nowadays... The younger you are, the more you're involved in technology. So, yeah. um, but when uh, in the '90s, uh, after I was married, my dad actually invented a video technology system that allowed for the transmission of live video, like we're doing right now, but over a T1 phone line for for transmission. This was before the internet. Okay. Um, so you could do point to point live video audio transmission to replace satellite links. Uh, it was one of the first practical uses of the MPEG standard. Uh, when it came out. Yeah. And so I was always great at the sales and marketing side. I had worked for Tandy. I had worked in their computer centers. Uh, I had been in the computer business for a few years at that point, and he needed somebody on the sales and marketing side. He was more of the engineering type. And so I came and I worked for him and we sold those systems all over the world. Hmm. Um, and that's really where I cut my teeth on, on selling technology uh, internationally. The difference is in South America and Europe and Asia. And, and, you know, I was doing a lot of traveling in the mid nineties before there was really, um, you know, a lot of, uh, um, a lot of that kind of work being done. And we sold the system literally all over the world. We were successful enough that I built my own house in Boca Raton, Florida. Okay. And of course, being the nerd that I am, the geek that I am, I wanted my house to be structured wired. I wanted to have networking and, distributed audio and automated lighting and things in my own house. There was nobody who did this kind of work. Um, so I found a company called Future Smart. It was actually IES. Um, I don't even think you've been doing this long enough to remember them. So uh, they were a company out of Salt Lake City that came up with the very first structured wire. It was a, a bundle of wires. It was speed wrap. It was two pieces of fiber, two pieces of coax, and two pieces of Cat5, all uh, speed wound together into one bundle. Okay. And I bought the wire from them and I convinced Centex. Centex at the time was a, uh, a production builder. They were building my home Okay. because I had gone out to find integrators. There were a couple of integrators around at that point, but they essentially wanted, uh, you know, a quarter of a million dollars to do what I wanted them to do in my home. And I'm not embarrassed to tell you, my home was only worth a quarter of a million dollars at the time. <laughs> so there was no way that I was going to be able to afford, you know, what we were doing. So, I went through the pain. I convinced Centex to wire the, the nine drops of the structured wire and a big structured wire box in a, in a specific closet where I wanted it. Um, and we, we had to get special dispensation from the Palm Beach County because Palm Beach County had never seen this stuff before. Mm. So they had no idea what the heck it was. Um, I had to instruct the electrician in how to wire it because he didn't understand bend radius and he didn't understand, you know, how to put it in. And then I terminated it all because he didn't even have the tools to terminate the cat five wire. He had no idea what it was. Okay. I went through all of that. There was a company out called cyber house. Uh, cyber house is a company out of Boston. They were the very first central PC based controller software. Hmm. I put cyber house in my house. It, it ran on a PC on a windows 95 PC. 
with serial connections out the back and an X10 converter. Hmm. So my first house was serial thermostats, X10. Um, it was a RCS thermostats way back in the day, X10 lighting. That's how I met Bill Scheffler for the first time. Um, and I built my house and I automated it with this software and it was awesome. And I loved it. And I realized there's a business opportunity here. Hmm. I can't be the only person who wants this. And I had self-taught myself, essentially. I had the IT background, but I self-taught myself the whole infrastructure wiring AV side of the business. And so it dawned on me that there has to be, you know, other people must want this as well. So I started a company. Okay. I started a company called Homeworks Automation. Uh, the first mistake I made was I needed a license. I had no idea. I opened up the business and went to work. And uh, the state of Florida knocked on my door one day. They're like, hey, are you doing security installs? I'm like, yeah. They're like, no, <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. You need a license. Go get a license. So in the state of Florida, it was much easier to partner with somebody than it was to actually go and get your own license. So mm -hmm. I found a partner, uh, a gentleman by the name of David Botnick. Uh, David and I started uh, the company together, essentially. He had a low voltage license. He had an EF license, as it was called. We became partners and Homeworks Automation actually still exists to this very day. Uh, Homeworks is still going strong in Florida. But after doing it for about 10 years, I was completely burned out. We were doing uh, somewhere in the order of 5,000 installs a year. We had three offices, Orlando, Boca Raton, and Tallahassee. We were the preeminent low voltage um, integrator in the state of Florida. We had opened a custom division, made it on the cover of CE Pro Magazine. You know, we were famous, right? We were going great, but I was working 110 hours a week and I was oh my done. Yeah. And so I went to my partner. I had made a name for myself in the industry at that point, And I had been approached by a couple of manufacturers who were interested in bringing me in. Now, I had never worked for a manufacturer before, ever. Um, but... Dave Hanchett was a, a guy who worked for um, OnQ back in the day. Uh, Dave and I sat on the HANA board together. That was the Home Automation and Networking Association. Uh, I was recruited by Julie Jacobson and Dwayne Paulson, who weren't even married yet, mm -hmm. um, to sit on the HANA board. Uh, Julie and I had met at a uh, at a um, in an expo at a uh, um, what was it HD Expo. HD Expo. EHX. EHX. That's yeah. it. EHX. Uh, we had met at EHX because uh, Lisa Montgomery had interviewed David and I and put us on the cover of CE Pro. Mm. And so I met Julie. She had me sit on a uh, on a panel discussion with her in an EHX in Orlando. And they decided I'd be great to sit on the HANA board. I met Dave Hanchett. Dave Hanchett. And by the way, I, I blame or applaud julie for all of this because it was all julie's fault mm -hmm. um because i met uh dave hanchett dave recruited me to go work for on mm. they had just had the failed merger with leviton and they had essentially gotten rid of all of their inside people all of their product people because leviton was going to do the product development and on was going to be sort of the sales and marketing side of things when the merger failed he had to recruit so I was one of the people that he recruited. Uh, he moved me from Boca Raton to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, <laughs> where OnQ was based. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked on his marketing staff for five years and really learned the the corporate side of the business. Um, I was very tired of, of installing what I consider to be other people's mistakes, right? This was a company that had some great technology, but had never worked in the field. Okay. They never, you know, they, they, they never went with an integrator to an install to see what the pain points were of being an integrator in the field. Hmm. I had that experience. Yeah. So we, me along with a whole bunch of other people, Walt Zerby and, and a bunch of others, right. We, we really changed uh, the landscape at on um, We were part of the merger when they brought in gray Fox and then subsequently the merger with Legrand. Uh, and so we were part of that rollout for a while. Um, and working for the French was, was, difficult mm. i'll leave it at that if you've never worked for a french bureaucratic company um it was it was tough and i was uh, asked to start what i had done at on but at the next level which was with a company called saperna saperna was an israeli startup they had a really cool set top box this was back in the day when we thought that everything was going to be based on the set top box in the living room yeah. this was the day of windows media player mm -hmm. and other things where everybody was looking at the living room as being the center of control these guys had figured out how to put um x10 and z-wave 
Um, we had done some Z-Wave work at OnQ. Um, they were UPB, and we converted them from UPB to Z-Wave uh, until Legrand came in and bought them out and said, Z-Wave, no, 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 we don't deal with the Z-Wave stuff. Go back to UPB. Um, and they had their own top dog, as they called it. But mm -hmm. uh, Saperna wanted me, and I ran sales and marketing for Saperna for a number of years. We, uh, we set up worldwide distribution of this product. We did all the major trade shows. Um, it was a lot of fun. It was a great, great product. It was actually started by the guys, the, the Israeli family that had invented ICQ. If you remember AOL back in the day, their instant messaging system was ICQ. Oh. ICQ. Well, they sold ICQ, this very small internet startup, to AOL for hundreds of millions of dollars before selling things to internet people were a big thing yet. Hmm. And they leveraged this money into I'm gonna excuse me, I'm gonna start a home control company, right? How many times have we heard? Rich folk deciding to start a home control company it happens all the time and not any of them have been successful yet, but that's beside the point. Um, so I worked with Saperna for quite a while um, and it was a great, great group. Um, traveled the world. We set up worldwide distribution, had dealers in virtually every time zone. Uh, it was a really, really great time. And then the world came to a crashing end because the Great Recession hit. Okay. And we were venture backed. We were venture funded. Um, I remember our lead investor was Steve Case from AOL. Oh, wow. And I was sitting in a room with Steve Case and the end was near and he looked around and he said, my advice to you is buy gold, go live in a cave. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. And okay. This is Steve Case who was, you know, had a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so from there, I jumped to my stint in commercial where I did work with a company called Evolve. Um, for a year, essentially, I had... Uh, uh, consulted with them during the Great Recession, right? Because nobody was really working on anything at that point. Um, and these guys had a really great idea to automate and bring technology to every hotel room in America. Uh, the owner of the company was a really, really great guy, um, took me under his wing and and gave me all the resources that I need to develop this. He had been to Europe and I'm sure you've seen it where you put your key card in the little slot in the wall and it turns everything on. Oh, sure. And he came up with the concept. He wanted to do one of those, but he wanted to do it retrofit. And so we used the Z-Wave technology to build that system out where you could go into a hotel room, replace the electrical devices, and turn it into a, a green room, if you will, mm -hmm. by putting that little card in the slot. Um, this worked really, really well. And we were very successful. Um, this is where I did the, the ultimate project of my career. Everybody knows me for, which is the Win hotel. Mm. Well, we installed 65,000 Z wave devices in the Win hotel in Las Vegas. Uh, it was my other 15 minutes of fame. You might say everybody knew about this install. Everybody came to see it. It was a lot of fun. Um, we, we were the only vendor. They did a complete, um, uh, redo of that hotel inside. It was a complete renovation inside. And we were the only vendor that was on budget and on time. Everybody else ran over. Uh, everybody else ran, you know, late. Uh, we managed to get everything done. Steve Wynn, I, I've met him a couple of times and uh, he's a, he's a tough cookie, but he's a nice guy. Um, and he actually walked the rooms uh, himself to make sure that we had done what we said we were going to do. Uh, and from there, uh, I was working with Evolve and I was recruited. Dwayne Polson at that point had joined Linear as they were then known. Uh, he had joined Linear to put them into turnaround, essentially. Um, they, they had come off a couple of rough years. They were, you know, they had been around a long time, but they really had lost their way. And so they brought Dwayne and Mike O'Neill in to do, to, to put the company in turnaround. Um, Dwayne recruited me to run the residential products division of uh, Linear, which then became known as Nortec Secure and Control which is now nice, all right? Mm -hmm. We, we uh, did very, very well there. In the four years I was there before they were sold to the private equity group, um, we engineered the, the buyout of 2Gig, and we brought 2Gig under the fold. Um, I started a, a brand called Go Control, which is a very successful mm -hmm. Z-Wave brand. Uh, we invented the Z-Wave garage door controller, which is still sold you know, all over the country. Uh, Lowe's carried it for a long time and, and a bunch of others. Um, and then from there, when the private equity group came in, um, they gave me a very nice going away present. It was very nice of them. Um, I was very happy to take it. And so we, uh, we took the going away present and I went looking for my next gig. Uh, I just assumed that I would, you know, go work for one of the, one of the big companies and my phone started to ring. Um, it was companies that were looking for advice that were looking for a consultant. Okay. I had no idea what it was like to be a consultant. I had never been a consultant before. 
Um, I actually had to be taught how to be a consultant, uh, but I started off doing it by myself for uh, about a year and a half. And then uh, Robert Heiblum and uh, Lou Brown, um, they were running a group called Blue Sav. And at that point, Dwayne had left Nortech. David Kaplan had joined me. So it was Dwayne, David, and I. Uh, we were then joined by a gentleman by the name of Dan Quigley. Uh, Dan is a, a famous Amazon Microsoft employee. He's been around a long time. He also did um, uh, the, the very first IP control system uh, in our space way back in the day. I remember uh, he's that. the one who gave yeah. Yeah, Jim Hunter and Dan Quigley. Um, and so they, uh, Dan then joined us. And so Lou and Robert approached us and said, why don't we build this all together? Hmm. And so in April of 2019, we merged. Um, what had become my group, CEIOT Consulting, with Blue Sav and made Blue Sav partners. Um, and we've been going at it ever since. We're now uh, up to 15 people in the group. We've got uh, oh, about 30, 35 clients uh, of various sizes. Where some, you know, we've done work with big, huge companies like, you know, Netgear and Comcast and, and some of those. And then we've done work with little companies that you've never heard of, like Den Smart Lock, where we've developed the very first Z-Wave uh, Smart Strike, which is a, a product that we announced at uh, Cedia last year. Uh, we now have uh, at CES, and we're about to go into production with it, um, working on mostly connected device, IoT product, right? Because mm -hmm. it, it is our focus. Um, we were unfortunate enough, we, we lost Robert this past January, but we are uh, we're keeping on in his memory. Uh, we miss them every day. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. But uh, you know, we're we're very excited about the future. Um, we thought that COVID would really slow down the consulting world, and it didn't. Um, actually, our business has thrived. Uh, we're helping a lot of companies with a lot of new technologies. Uh, we're involved in not just. I know I talk a lot about Z-Wave because it is a passion of mine. But we do work in Zigbee, and we do work in Thread, and we do work in Bluetooth and and Wi-Fi. Um, we're very involved in, in watching what's going on with matter, uh, very involved with what's going on in, uh, in trade. Um, there are four of us within the group all sit on various CTA committees. Uh, I sit on the trade watchers committee. Uh, David is part of smart home. Lou is in the small business council. Uh, Mike is on the audio group. So we're, we're very involved in the industry. We feel very strongly about bringing back something to the industry. Uh, whether it's through work in diversity or, or STEM. Uh, we do volunteer work with both of those initiatives, uh, the Women in Technology Group and, and others, um, in order to bring more people into our industry. Uh, I think we talked a little bit about where I see the future of technology going. Mm -hmm. We're only going to get there if we're able to spread our wings and really reach out to the young people of the world uh, and convince them to work in our industry. I think that's going to be our, our biggest challenge in the next five years is convincing folks to join the consumer technology industry as a whole and, and get trained and, and work within our industry. So we're, we're working on that initiative as well. Well, it, it's a, it's a great group of people, a lot of great experience there. And um, I'm sure that, uh, that when, when folks work with you, they, they see that firsthand and uh, you can ramp up a company just getting started with all of your, your trials and tribulations in the industry and personal experiences and, uh, insight. So uh, great to learn so much more about your company, Avia. Yeah, now I'll know exactly what it is you're doing when I see you <laughs> at the next event. <laughs> um, I never have much time to get this deep into the conversation. So thanks for the, the conversation today and best of luck for the rest of the year. Thank you so much. And look, I, I appreciate the time and I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about it. I'm, uh, you know, some people are going to laugh and be like, oh, it's obvious talking about his favorite subject again. And, and yeah, a little bit. But uh, my favorite subject is the industry. Um, I'm very lucky in the fact that I turned a hobby into a career. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about it is, you know, where other guys may be talking about golf or, or something else on the weekends. I'm usually messing around with a piece of tech, you know, whether it be car tech or, or home tech. There's usually, you know, some some piece of tech being uh, played with in my house. So, well, I thank know, you. I know who to call when I'm having trouble with my with my tech. Absolutely, so. <laughs> Thanks. absolutely. All right. Well, Avi Rosenthal is managing partner for Blue Sav Partners. You can learn more about his company at bluesav.com. And that wraps up today's show. If you're new to residential tech talks, please subscribe to the weekly podcast on your preferred platform and consider rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. 
Also, check out all the latest residential tech news at the magazine's website, restechtoday.com, where you can also subscribe to the print or digital magazine and to our Tuesday and Friday email newsletters. Until next time, please stay safe, stay inspired, and let us know if you have a great story to tell. Residential 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 Residential